one at this point. So just want to welcome everybody to our committee meeting for the for the advocacy committee for the Disability Commission for the City of Athens. We do have a guest speaker coming in today, so we are going to give our majority of our time to her so she can actually talk and, you know, tell us what she does and the great work that she does. Um, so in the meantime, let's go ahead and just run through some old business right now. For anybody that has any old business items that they would like to talk about, I do want to again thank Lisa for inviting our previous speaker into our meeting last month. A lot of great information was given, a good dialogue was given. And so as we move into these next couple of um, the next couple of months, specifically during the summer, if there is anybody that we would love to have in front of us today, um, then make sure that you give me or you provide me any information, including their email address, anything of that nature, so we can make sure that they are clear to sign on and get the pro get the proper link. What I would like to do in the next couple of months, in the fact that we are closing up, well, we're in May right now. And if you can believe it, our year is already halfway halfway done, you know, in terms of the calendar year. And so for the next meeting, whether it is in June or July, depending if we do have a guest speaker or not, I would love for us to revisit our goals of the committee and just see what the time there that is permitted left um, with this with this calendar year, what goals are feasible, what goals are reachable. And then what goals, what, what type of short-term goals may we want to approach and actually create in the time that we have? Personally speaking, the summer is a little bit lighter for me because the students aren't really here on campus. So for me, I can really give a lot more of my time to both the committee and to the commission. And so I don't know if anybody else has that same increased flexibility during the summertime versus during the spring or during the fall. But if that's the case, then we can definitely start leveraging some of our resources and some of our manpower in terms of goals, in terms of designing, or just where we may want to be at for next year as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say it may be just the opposite with me. Um, I am so excited about doing a little traveling and stuff this summer, so I may be a little bit more, I may be less visible, if that makes sense, you know but I'll, I'll do what I can to be, be when I can, where I can. That makes so that makes complete sense. And I do appreciate you saying that as well. I'm getting little, little, um, I'm getting little, little messages in terms of <laughs> which I appreciate um, in terms of, uh, so just some, just some house or business. Um, I, in terms of approving minutes, in terms of us having quorum and things of that nature. Um, I am traveling right now, and that's why specifically I'm asking about increased flexibility. So I'm actually in Arizona right now. Oh, uh, good for so you. I do not have our previous minutes, and so we will have to approve those at our next coming meeting in June. So in June, we'll approve both our May minutes and also our April minutes or so from our guest speaker talk or so. Um, and because this is being broadcast live, I do will quickly introduce who I am and what the committee is and our purpose and such like that. So my name is Sly Mata. I sit as the chair of the Disability Advocacy Committee, which sits within the Disability Commission for the City of Athens. Our purpose and our mission of the committee is to advocate for those, for that community that may identify as having a disability, but also using our, our leverage, our privilege, our power, and whatever the case that may be to help others be identified, be visible, be seen, and help them in terms of their tasks or in terms of their goals as well. And let me see. And with that being said, if you can just verbalize yourself on the microphone, just take yourself off mute real quickly and just introduce yourself um, to, the, to our audience today. We're all just dying to go. So I'll just, uh, I'm J.W. Smith, a member of the committee. And um, I'm a member because I think advocacy is really important. Um, I, I think the older I get, the more, the more it means to me. Speaking for someone else or, or speaking with someone else is a better way to say it. Sometimes you have to do both. And so that's what excites me about the mission here. 
is that I get a chance to speak for in some cases and with someone in some, in some cases for for the good of them and the good of all of us. Okay, and Lisa, can you introduce yourself as well? Yes, I am Lisa Simpson, and I have uh, worked in the field of developmental disabilities for 42 years, and we've had a lot of um, legislative forums and different ways to advocate for those issues that are very important to individuals, and I'm just hoping to uh, continue down that pathway to make things a little better for all of us. Okay, and Mr. Noah, would you do the same for us as well? Like something that you need to do is get a CEO chair. This is Noah Trembley. I'm the CEO chair of the commission. And there we go. Thank you, Noah, for being here. And thank you for the committee to be here as well. I think that we have one of the things that we haven't talked about too much, and I do want to take this moment to express gratitude, is the fact that we are a group of volunteers for those that are watching this we're a group of volunteers that love this work are passionate about this work and are committed to this work but one of the things that we haven't really talked about or discussed is we've talked about it in a limited format in terms of some of the national climate issues that are going around the country some of the um self-care that does need to be advocated for ourselves and for our members in terms of some of the issues that are affecting Ohio, both within the Disability Commission and those that are affecting, you know, those that identify as the other outside that majority. Um, and so because of that, you know, I'm very grateful for this committee. I think that in the last four months or so, we have really been able to turn a page and really have started to create a, a, an identity for this committee in terms of who we are, what we like to do and where we want to go forward. And given that hard work, given the fact of other things that are going around in the country, other things that may be affecting us, I want to thank you all for being here, participating and really, really moving this forward. This is a lot of work and sometimes it is exhausting. And especially when, you know, you take into account some of the other things that we are balancing in our lives. So with that, I do want to be grateful and thankful for everybody that is here including some of our members that are not here for various reasons as well. And so with that, I, there is one other person in our audience that I do want to identify just because if I do not, I do not want her to come back and tell me the slide you forgot about me. So Dr. Lewis, if you could also introduce yourself, um, because I want to give all, all grace and acknowledgement to you as well. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, I would not uh, say anything to you about that. I appreciate being here. And uh, I am the treasurer of the commission. And it's just a privilege to see change. I think uh, since I've been on and others such as Noah and Davey and Diane and all of you, uh, we're moving together. And that's what makes a team. And I serve because when you advocate, uh, it makes a difference. Thank you. Okay. Most definitely. And I want to thank you for that, because I think oftentimes we tend to advocate for ourselves. We tend to look at our identity and see where we need to stand up for ourselves, but to advocate for others and to really be able to identify the need of others is a privilege that I am happy to have, you know, be doing in this group and this in this organization. And, you know, this is one of my better meetings that I volunteer for for the month. So thank you all for being here. One of the quick things I do want to bring everybody's still attention and because of Noah speaking, I wanted to bring this back up. I've been one of the things that we talked about prior to our last couple of meetings is the fact that those that identify with a disability may not have been able to really get the full benefits of the stimulus because of lack of working hours, lack of time committed to work, things of that nature. 
previous in the last couple of months, I've been trying to get sit downs with people in terms of the social security office here in Athens, in terms of even communicating with people in Columbus to really see what we can do to help bring this to a bigger attention, what we can do to really navigate different resources to different community members. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really hitting a wall. So I may tag somebody else within our committee to assist with me in this. I appreciate Noah bringing this to our attention because again, from my identity and, and my privilege, it's not something that was made aware to me until he brought it up to me. But upon reading different articles you know, through both national news organizations and just, you know, more city news. I've been seeing that this is a national phenomenon where those that have a disability are not getting equal treatment, equal benefits regarding the stimulus, which is then having them to worry about basic necessities, how to pay, how to pay bills and things of that nature. So Lisa, I may tag you offline out of this meeting and like talk to you about some of the strategy I had and maybe have you quarterback some missed opportunities I may not have seen or, you know, future opportunities that we may be able to really, um, really hone in on to really make change. Because okay. one of the things is with the new tax deadline coming up in a couple of weeks, with other stimulus packages coming out, being rolling out like every month or so, I want to be sure that we are still seeking that help or being able to provide that help for others that may need it. Okay. And Lisa, you were gonna say something? No, no, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. <laughs> Our guest is here, Mr. Chair, whenever you're ready. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, um, that is really pretty much all of our old business. One other thing that I do want to say as we give the majority of our time to our guest speaker is, again, in the next month or so, and I will send out an email for a reminder, let's also continue to look for options for collaboration. Let's also look for options or opportunities to collaborate with other committees or other, new, other, or other organizations within Athens with a similar purpose. I think that right now it is a paramount time to really navigate that power and that privilege that we may have as a community and really be able to direct that energy. With that, we do have a guest speaker today and I'm grateful for J.W. Smith for being able to bring in a guest speaker today that really does some amazing work. Ms. Allison McKay, I've read your bio and to be honest with you, there is no way I could summarize in a complete fashion, all the great work that you do. So I am going to officially welcome you to the Disabilities, the Disabilities Advocacy Committee meeting. And thank you again for being here today and talking about the work that you do. So with, with, without further ado, Ms. Allison McKay. Thank you very much. Um, and that was a very nice introduction. I, I want to thank all of you for having me and especially Dr. Smith for reaching out and inviting me today. Um, it's always nice to be in a space with other advocates. Um, so I, I'm hoping that I can provide information about our organization uh, so that um, we can explore avenues for partnership, hopefully, or, or ways that we can be a resource to you. Um, uh, so I, I guess to get started, I can give a brief background about myself, and then I'll provide some information about Disability Rights Ohio. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, I'm pretty informal, and I don't. I'm. I will try and monitor chat if if uh, people prefer to use the chat space. Um, but. Uh, uh, to get started. Um, so I, I'm an attorney with Disability Rights Ohio. I've uh, been working with the organization for almost 10 years. I've been interested in disability advocacy um, probably my whole life. Uh, my brother is an advocate. Um, he has Down syndrome and he and my mom were both very involved with the Down Syndrome Association of Central Ohio growing up. Um, in college, I decided to pursue um, study in uh, communication disorders, which is speech language pathology, audiology, and learning disabilities. Um, and then from there went to teach special education. I, I got my master's in special education um, out in Las Vegas uh, with the Teach for America program. Um, 
And at some point thought that I wanted to get more in the uh, disability rights policy sphere. Um, and for some reason thought that law school would be a good idea. <laughs> so that took me back here to Columbus and I went to Ohio State um, and got my law degree with the hope of going into disability rights um, and got connected with the protection and advocacy system um, through internships and then went to work for Disability Rights Ohio um, following uh, law school. And at that time it was called Ohio Legal Rights Service. If you're familiar with Ohio Legal Rights Service, um, we used to be a state agency. So we've been around for probably since the seventies. Um, we were a state agency for many years um, and then moved into a the nonprofit sphere, became a nonprofit organization in 2012 and changed our name to Disability Rights Ohio. Um, so uh, Disability Rights Ohio, if you're not familiar, is the state protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities. So it is part of the broad network of protection and advocacy organizations across the country. So every state has a designated system, protection and advocacy system for people with disabilities. We're designated by the governor um, and we fulfill that role. So we have federal funding federal mandates to advocate and protect the rights of people with disabilities. Um, the protection and advocacy network uh, started in 1975, I think. Um, it was spearheaded by a s series of investigative reporting by Geraldo Rivera. Um, back in the 70s, he went into um, large institutions where basically they were warehousing people with disabilities um, and saw just terrible treatment, abuse, neglect, um, and exposed exposed just the horrible treatment of people with disabilities. So that kicked off. Um, Congress acted and said, we need to create a system to protect the rights of people with disabilities. So they created this system and provided funding um, in each state to, to do that work. And then over the year, it started just as a grant to advocate for people with developmental disabilities. And then um, more over the years, they created more and more grants for um, other types of advocacy. So at this point, we advocate for people with all types of disabilities. So the, the disability community is a large community. So we have we advocate for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people with mental health needs, behavioral health needs, people with traumatic brain injury. Um, and then we also do like issue area focus. Um, so we do advocacy for voting rights protection, um, advocacy for assistive technology, uh, a lot of different issues, in which I'll talk more about. Um, but uh, in, in all, we do uh, both individual and systemic advocacy for people across the state of Ohio. So we're based in Columbus, but we serve the entire state of Ohio. Um, and uh, when I say individual advocacy, I mean that people can contact our office um, if they have questions about their rights or they're having um, some type of legal issue that they need help with, and we can advocate for them on an individual basis. Um, and then systemic advocacy, we do um, a lot of work advocating for policies that impact people with disabilities. Mostly it's educating legislators and other stakeholders about how policies that are proposed would impact um, the community. And then we also um, try and connect with organizations and people with disabilities and families and other um, advocates to provide information about rights issues um, around the state. So we do that a lot with like our voting rights work um, for the, every election cycle, we try and go out and do um, kind of like educational trainings on here are your rights. Um, you know, if you need additional time in the polling booth, you have the right to additional time. If um, here's what you have, you can ask a poll worker for assistance if you need assistance. So 
we do a lot of that education through um, our vote, the, the grant that we have for edu- advocating for voting rights. Um, we are, so I'll talk more about the, the work that we do and the types of issues that we take. Um, but, but in terms of our organizational structure, we're governed by a board of directors that is composed primarily of people with disabilities or family members of people with disabilities. And then on our staff, we have both attorneys and advocates that come from a range of different backgrounds. So people who have um, background in social work or with the juvenile justice. Um, uh, uh, we've had former police officers um, because the, the the type of work that we do in our office is very uh, broad. Um, so, uh, well, um, but I guess I can I can move into that now. Um, the but. Uh, in order to be eligible for our services, uh, basically you just have to be a person with a disability. Um, it can be any type of disability and uh, there's no income requirement. Um, like if you're familiar with the legal aids, uh, legal aid systems, usually you have to meet a certain, be under a certain income eligibility threshold to qualify for their services. So we don't have any, any um, limitations like that. Um, and our, clients aren't charged for our services. So it's, it's, uh, we provide free, free legal advocacy. Um, one thing that is unique about our, our organization is that um, we are client directed. So um, if you're familiar with like a guardian ad litem system, a guardian ad litem acts in um, the person's best interests. So that's what they will advocate for. We are client directed, meaning that we advocate for what the person with the disability wants. Um, so we listen to the person with the disability. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily mean their guardian or their family member. We, we get direction from the actual person. Um, any, any questions before I talk about kind of the, the team's um, within our organization and the types of issues that we help with. Allison, how many cases do you take a year? Does it vary? How many cases? Yes. Oh, gosh. Um, I do not. <laughs> That's a great are you, are you question. Limited? Are you limited or? Uh, so I imagine that, I mean, I don't even know if I can ballpark that. Okay. 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 That's probably um, a good thing. That's probably a good thing. Okay. <laughs> Well, we get lots of calls um, right. and the level of assistance that we provide on a given case will vary depending on what issue the person is calling about. So every year we develop a um, list of what what are called priority categories. And I don't really like that terminology because any issue that someone's contacting us about is important. It's not like we, did, we think that some issues are more important, but we have because we cover the whole state, we have to um, kind of pick and choose what issues we can devote all of our resources towards. So um, that depending on whether someone's calling on a particular issue, we'll um, kind of, um, uh, that will impact the level of assistance. So we will always provide for all of our calls, at least information or referral services, if it's not something that we're going to be able to provide more help with. Um, but, uh, so I will say that in terms of how many cases we get a lot of calls, some would be just information and referrals, and then some we're going to be doing more work with. But um, that's a great question. And, and maybe I can follow up with you with that that's data. That's, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> and Allison, I do want to say, I do want to say, because you mentioned this earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt you. Feel free to talk. I'll monitor the chat for you because I know how sometimes talking and trying to look for questions is a difficult task sometimes, especially when you're talking about something you're passionate about so feel free to talk and we'll monitor the chat specifically i will and we'll bring it to your attention if any question does pop in that's great thank you so much i appreciate that of course (laughs) all right so um i i think um i'm gonna describe what 
teams we have in our office and then talk about the types of cases that we've handled recently, the types of issues that we're providing advocacy on to give you an idea of um, the type of advocacy that we've done throughout the past year. Uh, so we have, I believe, like nine or 10 teams. So the first is our education team. So we have a team of attorneys, um, three or four attorneys who do primarily special education work. And I will say the bulk of calls that we receive across the state are calls from families calling about special education services for their children. The, um, the issues that we focus on or we have been focusing on the past few years are restraint and seclusion of kids with disabilities. Um, Unfortunately, that's just been an issue where um, kids with disabilities in Ohio are still being restrained or um, secluded in individual rooms in their schools. So that's a priority priority area for us. Um, the school to prison pipeline is a priority. So kids with disabilities and particularly kids who come from um, brown or black families are more um, have a greater risk of being um disciplined in school, which, and and as we know, there are more school resource officers and police officers in school. So discipline in school then leads to um, those students uh, being um, targeted for the juvenile justice system. So when we get calls about that type of issue, um, kids being, um, and, and it's usually some type of behavior uh, that, that the school is complaining about. That's an issue that we would want to focus on uh, to try and prevent kids from being removed from the school so we can keep them there and they can get their education. Um, we also have a large uh, class action lawsuit that we, uh, I think it was filed in the 70s about um, school funding, um, special education funding, and it was settled just this last year. And so we're monitoring the settlement of um, making sure that the settlement is implemented uh, and to make sure that the, the school districts that are targeted in that settlement are uh, the special education programs are adequately funded. Um, any questions about education before I move on? Okay. I do want to ask. I do want to ask very quickly about the what what I heard you say about discipline and discipline being given or being attached to certain communities over others. Yeah. It, it sounds like there is a very strong internal or implicit bias in terms of certain communities to be seen certain ways and other communities to be seen another way. Where that discipline is not as harsh or is not as um, or sometimes it's more lenient. Can you talk about efforts that have been done or may have been um, undertaking to really attack that specific bias as it relates to discipline, as it relates to personal records, as it relates to a whole bunch of other items? That, um, that's a great question. That is spot on. Um, I am, because I don't practice in the education um, arena, I, I don't have um, as much experience with what is happening now. Um, I could try and connect you with one of our, with our education attorneys um, who could probably speak a lot more on that topic. Um, I just don't have the breadth of experience to, to provide more information, but, um, but that's, spot on <laughs> thank you sure um so the um the next team uh that we have is the employment team and the client assistance program and i am the team leader for the client assistance program and it's through this team uh that i met dr smith um because i uh as the client assistance program team leader, I uh, sit on the Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities Council. Um, so this team, we're focused on employment discrimination, um, access to reasonable accommodations in the workplace, and then access to job training services, um, any services that a person with a disability needs so that they can get keep and maintain work. Um, and the, the agency in Ohio that provides those types of services is Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. So 
our role through the client assistance program at Disability Rights Ohio is to help people when they're having problems getting those services. So if they, um, so for example, we get a lot of calls from college students who would like support to get their college degree that they need in order to um, land their career. And if, oh, if they're, um, counselor from opportunities for Ohioans with disabilities says, well, we can't support that, or we're not going to pay for that service. They can contact our office and we can advocate for them. Um, a lot of that is providing, um, information to, um, both our clients and the counselors about what the law says and what people are entitled to. And, and there's a whole appeal process if people disagree with, with the services that they've been offered. Um, in terms of employment discrimination, a lot of our work is um, limited in scope to providing information and legal advice um, about where people can file complaints or trying to connect them with um, attorneys who might be able to take their cases. The grant that we have um, has a, uh, is limited in terms of the type of advocacy that we can do for employment. So that's why it tends, our, our scope of work under that grant tends to be tends to be less. Um, but I could talk more about that, um, <laughs> those types of cases, because I work with those day in and day out. Um, but I'll move on. Uh, I, know, I know we're kind of limited in time. Um, the third team that we have is our civil rights and integration team. And they do a, uh, this is probably the, the team that does the broadest type of work. Mm -hmm. They have um, a victims of crime grant where uh, we advocate for people with disabilities who have been victims of crime. Mm -hmm. And that can be advocating for the prosecutor to actually prosecute a case against a person with a disability, because sometimes mm -hmm. prosecutors have just preconceived notions that people with disabilities might not be a good witness or they won't be able to communicate effectively. So we try and um, push if we believe that this is a case they, sh they should take, or it might just be accompanying the person um, to, to the courtroom so that they can feel comfortable testifying, um, a lot of different types of work. Uh, we also have on that team um, a Medicaid pro bono program uh, which connects people who uh, have um, who are going through a Medicaid appeal process. So maybe Medicaid has refused to pay for a wheelchair, or they need a waiver, a Medicaid waiver, and um, they've been denied, and they they have the right to appeal. And we try and connect them with attorneys around the state to represent them in those appeals. Um, we do. Um, Gosh, address disability discrimination. I mentioned voting rights, um, ensuring access to voting for people with disabilities. Um, we do a, a lot of uh, jail and prison advocacy to make sure that people with disabilities who are in prison have access to mental health treatment, um, that the facilities are physically accessible. Um, we recently issued a, a report about pervasive problems in, I think it was Cuyahoga County Jail. Um, uh, gosh, um, this year with the pandemic, the civil rights team um, did a lot of advocacy around ensuring equal, that people with disabilities were considered in the response to the pandemic. So um, we, where they were, um, building where hospitals were building protocols about rationing care. We wanted to make sure that um, care wasn't rationed on the basis of a person's disability or diagnosis. Um, we wanted to make sure that people with disabilities were considered uh, in priority for vaccines. Um, there was a lot of kind of reactionary work that we had to do because of the pandemic to um, kind of refocus our, our attention because there were such kind of significant rights issues at stake due to the pandemic. Um, yeah, you got about 10 minutes, Allison. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll move along. Um, one of the, the key teams, I would say the key, because this is kind of the uh, purpose, the reason that the protection and advocacy organizations were created is the abuse and neglect team. Um, the protection and advocacy systems are unique in that we have what's called access authority. 
This allows us to go into facilities where people with disabilities receive treatment. We can go into the facilities and talk with people um, to make sure that they're not being abused and neglected and their rights aren't being violated. So we go to facilities all across the state. So that could be behavioral health facilities, residential treatment facilities, youth residential treatment facilities, um, uh, just to make sure that um, people's rights are being protected. And then we can also investigate complaints. So we're contacted by family members, sometimes providers saying that, um, hey, this hospital isn't treating this patient appropriately, or there are some bad things that happened at this hospital. Will you come in and investigate? We can do an investigation and ask like the Ohio Department of Health or some of the other organizations to come in and, and look at that facility, for example. Um, we also have uh, a team that works on social security issues because we have a, a, a couple of grants for, from the Social Security Administration. So we have one that is called representative payee. So if someone's receiving social security benefits and um, they have designated a person mm -hmm. to manage their benefits for them, that person would be the representative payee. If that, if that person isn't doing what they're supposed to, um, if they're exploiting that individual, we can go in and audit them um, and report it to Social Security. Uh, so it's a program to basically to make sure that people people's benefits aren't being used without their permission. Um, and then we also have through that team um, benefits planners. So um, people with disabilities, if you receive Medicaid or Social Security benefits and you want to go to work, but you're concerned about how your wages will impact your receipt of those benefits, you're afraid you're going to lose Social Security if you go to work, the, the benefits planners on those teams can do an analysis and tell you if you work basically to the minute, this many minutes, this many hours, here's how your benefits are going to be impacted. So you can make an informed decision about, about work. Um, and then we have uh, an intake and short-term assistance team that provides help on issues that wouldn't be considered our priority issues. Um, they do a lot of work with housing, for example, housing rights. Um, we've had cases where kind of NIMBY, not in my backyard cases, where neighbors or um, communities will complain that people with disabilities have moved into their neighborhood and they'll say they have concerns with like providers or other types of things. And we can advocate um, to make sure that people with disabilities aren't discriminated against by like condo associations or, or other, other issues. Um, our policy team, um, so I mentioned this earlier, they do work educating legislators, stakeholders about how policies impact people with disabilities. So right now we're focused on this on the budget. Um, and uh, we we recently submitted testimony to focus on six issues that we believe impact people with disabilities. Um, like increasing wages um, for direct support professionals. Um, and, and we're trying to take an intersectional approach because we found that uh, the majority of those direct support professionals are black women um, and they're making wages that are below what you'd make their, um, if you worked at like a fast food restaurant and these are people doing really complex, important care for people with disabilities. So we're advocating for increased um, uh, support for, for increased wages. Um, drawing down more vocational rehabilitation funding to support people with disabilities going to work, um, providing additional oversight of hospitals, um, trying to decrease nursing home capacity by providing more home and community-based support, um, funding for care coordination to prevent people being placed in an institutional setting or congregate care setting, um, and then increasing investments to support multi-system youth and preventing custody relinquishment. Um, a lot of times if, uh, if families can't get the support that they need in the home, they will relinquish care of their children to um, um, children's services so that they can pay, so that children's services can pay for the supports that the children need. We, would, we want to try and get ac more access to um, funding to prevent that type of relinquishment from happening. 
Um, and then lastly, we have a communications and outreach team where we try and get out and provide information um, and to people with disabilities um, and other st stakeholders. So um, I think that's it. I've, I've done a really broad overview. Um, I didn't get into anything in too much detail. So I'm sorry, I feel like I've just been rambling on too, but <laughs> I am happy to answer any questions. Um, or if I, and if I don't know, I will try and follow up with you and connect you with resources. Anybody I just want to say it's been, a joy, it's, it's been a joy working with Allison on, on the, um, on the council. And I love how she can <clears throat> delve through all these, the minutia on these policies and make sense of them. That's fascinating. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, awesome. Oh, no, <laughs> no, you're great. Um, at this point, I do want to open up for any questions that either from the committee or anybody that is watching, please use the chat function to um, either take yourself off your meet to ask a question or please put your question into, into the chat. I guess one question I have, Allison, is, um, you know, for us, we are a subcommittee of a commission here in Athens. Um, what type of support would you think, or let me let me backtrack just a little bit more, because as we look as a committee to continue to build bridges and collaboration efforts with different associations and different organizations, for a committee such as ours or other communities or other committees that may be listening, what is the best way do you feel to go about to build that collaboration or to make sure that yeah. it's fluid? Still in Athens, can you believe that nine years? Go ahead, Noah. Here, help me out. Yes, I'm still in Athens. Can you believe that? Nine years also, if you remember me. I do, Noah. I was. I saw your name there. I was so happy to see you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and it's great to see that you're still advocating, too. Oh, Noah keeps us on our on our wheels, so he keeps us pretty pretty busy. <laughs> but what, Allison? What do you think is the starting point to building collaborations for associations like yours? Um, from some people watching today, this may be this may be the first time that they've heard of you all. And for people like JW, you know, that's well versed in the work that you that you do. So, what is a what is that starting point of collaboration, or at least introduction um, for you all? So um, that's a great question. Um, I I think that um, it I, I'm going to give you the contact for our policy and communications directors first um, because uh, I think that oh I'm sorry um, got phone phone off <laughs> um, I. They'll have so they will promote um, the issues, at least that we're working on. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If there's ways for us to partner with you all, um, I know that uh, we're definitely um, trying to get more people familiar with our services too. Um, and uh, if uh, we're always trying to find ways to reach more people. Um, so if there are communities that you think um, would uh, that could use um, some of our services, legal advocacy or something like that, we would love to get out there and speak with them. Um, uh, at least that's what I can say right now. Does that committee travel like whenever we get back to face to face? If we had a program, could we get somebody down here to do a presentation? Ab yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, that would that, be great. That might be great from the communication. That's a great. That's I know you have that team. That's great. We're also trying to um, uh, hire a um, advocate who whose mission will kind of be to build advocacy skills um, in the community. So do training oh, nice. on, nice. on advocacy. So that I'm. Oh, I, if you do that, please let us know about that. If there are going to be classes or something we could take. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That'd be sweet. laughs> 
I guess JW, JW's comment about traveling also brings up another question. For you all in the work that your association does, can you talk about how the pandemic may have shifted the way that you approach being able to provide that assistance to either specific individuals or to communities overall? Yeah, that's a great question too, because we did have to shift. Um, so we went to we went to work remotely. Um, and I had mentioned a lot of the a lot of our teams do um, go out into facilities to make sure that people's rights are being protected. So with the facilities kind of shut down, um, oh. we had to kind of figure out a way to do that. So we developed uh, what we call virtual monitoring, where we connect with people in facilities, oh. uh, video conferencing, and other types of technology. To, oh, sorry. Um, to, to try and, and do that type of monitoring remotely. Um, I think it has been fairly successful, but we are looking forward to being able to go back into those facilities physically. Um, a lot of the work that we do on the legal advocacy end um, is, I think was done remote in a sense already. So we could advocate in like administrative hearings by phone before, so we could still do that type of work. Um, but, uh, but I would say it was, it was a, a bit of a ship to go completely, completely remote. remote. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it did shift our priorities where we had to direct attention to kind of significant rights issues that were um, kind of uh, caused by the pandemic. So like we said, we were really um, concerned about rationing care um, and making sure that people with disabilities weren't being um, discriminated against on the basis of their disability uh, in hospital settings. Um, we, we were taking a lot of more calls regarding um, issues related to the pandemic, like uh, visitation policies. So if a person needs uh, support, either a family member or their support staff, aid, um, direct support professional to go with them into that setting, either because they need help communicating or physically, um, there were issues with visitation policies at hospitals. So we were ha trying to advocate for reasonable accommodations for people. Um, so that type of that we had to kind of shift the type of work that we were doing. But um, that was a great question. <laughs> I just want to say that Allison uh, took me up, took me up on my offer for the 10 minute. That's why I said 10 minutes. She said, you might want to give me that. And so that's why I gave it a 10 minute <laughs> I <know>. sound. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> So Allison, we did as I don't know if you were on here when uh, Sly talked about us trying to help people that didn't receive stimulus. Is that something that you guys helped it with? Did I hear you say that? If some so, if someone with a disability did not receive stimulus. So I don't know if any of our teams are focusing on that issue, but I will go back and see if that is um, something that we are looking at or whether that's something that we could potentially look at and follow up with you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do one last round or one last call for any questions for our, our incredible and amazing guests today. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Send us send us any kind of info you think would be helpful to us. Great. Please. Great. We'll do. I can tell you our agency has worked with your um, agency in the past and it was it was wonderful. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah, this was it helped so many people. So thank you. Great. Uh, what agency do you work with? Have our incorporated. Yeah. We've had people that have, have been victims of crime and various things. So great. You've been a wonderful resource. Right. Okay. Well, seeing no other questions, I do want to say, you know, in, in, in a dual statement, you know, thanking Miss McKay for being here today. Um, it's been a pleasure 
to hear. I'm actually getting messages on, you know, social media saying, oh, my God, this is so great to hear this information. So I will say that people that I know are watching and they have they've enjoyed today. So thank you again for being here. And I do want to thank JW for introducing you to us and having you come in in a formal way to really share some of the work that you've done and the work that you're continuing to do. And we thank you. Yeah, now you're a star on TV in Athens, Allison. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. I, I really enjoyed this time. So thank you for having me. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So with that, I will close this meeting. Everybody take care. Be on the lookout for notes and some additional tasks before we see each other again. Um, and for those that are watching this for the first time, we typically meet the first Tuesday of the month. And so our next meeting will be, as I pull up the calendar right hey, now. What is it? June? No, June, yeah. June 1. June 1. So the June, June 1st. Wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we are today on Star Wars Celebration. May the 4th be with you. And we'll see each other again June 1st. So everybody take care. Stay safe. And we'll see you. We'll see each other soon. Thanks. Bye.